Whether you put a piece of your paycheck into a retirement account every month or you actively pick your own stocks, you should know that NVIDIA sits near the top of the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ. So knowing what they're up to gives you a big leg up as an investor. Well, NVIDIA's big GTC event is going on right now, making this the perfect time to decide if NVIDIA's stock is a good investment. But there's a lot of misinformation out there when it comes to NVIDIA, and I have a real bone to pick with how the mainstream finance media covers it. Let me show you what I mean. Here's Jim Cramer on the first day of GTC from earlier this year. What it all boils down to is that NVIDIA is one or two steps ahead of the competition in nearly every market where it competes. And I say they are light years ahead of all companies when it comes to artificial intelligence melding with machine learning. Here's the bottom line. I know this is a tough market for a stock like NVIDIA, and I wouldn't be surprised if it has another leg lower. But when you look at what this incredible company is coming up with, I think NVIDIA owns the future. That's why I still love the stock long term, and I view any weakness as a chance to buy more gradually on the way down. So Jim Cramer likes NVIDIA. He actually likes them so much that he named his dog after them. My initials are AMD, and even I think that's weird. But NVIDIA's stock is almost 50% lower from when Jim Cramer said to buy it in that clip. So he must love it at this much lower price, right? Let's see what he said at the start of this most recent GTC. And we're short NVIDIA, it's a loser. You do not need their cards anymore to mine. And at the same time, they haven't been able to make the transition yet to being artificial intelligence, a virtual reality. Uh, we're just not there yet, uh, machine learning. See, this is why we can't have nice things. In this episode, we'll take a look at the science behind the stock to decide if Nvidia's future is really one worth investing in. Your time is valuable, so let's get right into it. Nvidia has a $1 trillion total addressable market, which can be broken down into roughly five big buckets, $300 billion in automotive, another $300 billion in chips and systems, $150 billion each in AI software and Omniverse software, and another $100 billion in gaming. Let's start with gaming, since that's usually what people think of when they hear Nvidia. NVIDIA currently has a big problem when it comes to gaming. Their gaming revenue was down 33% from a year ago and down 44% from just last quarter. That's an insane drawdown, so it's worth digging into. Here's what's going on. NVIDIA's gaming revenue primarily comes from their discrete GPUs, or graphics processing units, which are the chips that bring computer visuals to life. NVIDIA is by far the market leader in GPUs, with around an 80% market share. AMD owns the other roughly 20%. Back in 2020, when the pandemic lockdowns first started, production lines were stopped, delivery services were ground to a halt, and every part of the supply chain was disrupted. At the same time, demand for gaming hardware skyrocketed since everyone was stuck inside. As a result, Nvidia's revenue from gaming ballooned up to over $3 billion in just a single quarter, marking an 85% increase from the year before. That's a truly insane growth rate for such a big company. But that insane growth in GPU sales didn't just come from gamers. It also came from Ethereum miners. The problem here is that all of Nvidia's GPU sales are reported as revenue from gaming, regardless of what they were actually used for. That's why Nvidia had to pay $5.5 million earlier this year as part of a settlement with the SEC. According to this SEC filing, which started back in 2018, Nvidia didn't properly inform investors about how much of their GPU sales actually went to crypto miners and what that could mean for their GPU demand in the future. Now Nvidia has another big problem. The Ethereum blockchain is about to switch from proof of work to proof of stake. All you need to know about that is that this is a fundamental change in how Ethereum gets mined, which means Nvidia's GPUs won't be used to mine it anymore. This is where the decline in gaming revenue is coming from. But it's actually even worse than that, because Ethereum miners will decommission their mining rigs and sell their NVIDIA GPUs on the secondary market, and at a steep discount. So they'll end up cannibalizing a good chunk of NVIDIA's sales to gamers over the next few years. And just to add even more fuel to the fire, EVGA is ending their partnership with NVIDIA. EVGA is one of NVIDIA's earliest and longest standing partners. They've been making awesome versions of NVIDIA's graphics cards since 1999, and many gaming nerds, including me, only buy GPUs made by EVGA. Last week, they announced that they would stop making NVIDIA's GPUs due to the bleak financial outlook after the Ethereum merge, as well as alleged mistreatment from NVIDIA themselves. EVGA's CEO Andrew Hahn said despite his company holding around a 40% market share of NVIDIA's cards in North America, NVIDIA would keep EVGA in the dark on component prices and regularly undercut them with their own first-party branded cards. Yikes. 
The one grain of salt I'll add here is that Nvidia discouraged the use of their cards for crypto mining. In fact, they added software that actively limits the hash rate of RTX cards. It was actually EVGA that supported mining on their cards and released drivers to bypass Nvidia's first party software limits. I'm not trying to defend Nvidia here, I'm just pointing out that this breakup between them and EVGA isn't as black and white as some mainstream news sites are making it out to be. So Nvidia's gaming revenue is definitely in trouble, at least in the short term. But Nvidia is not a gaming company, at least not anymore. In fact, gaming made up just 30% of their $6.7 billion in revenue for the quarter. Even before the steep decline, their gaming revenue would still be almost a billion dollars lower than their data center revenue, which was $3.8 billion for the quarter and up 61% from this time last year. This is the part of the business that Jim Cramer both is bullish on or bearish on, depending on when you ask him. Nvidia has a few different data center chips that are worth talking about, many of which were highlighted during GTC. Let's start with their A100 Tensor Core GPUs. These processors are specifically designed for data centers focused on AI, data analytics, and high performance computing. This is a massive market that's quickly growing. Nvidia's new H100 data center chips were announced at their most recent GTC event earlier this year. They're a massive step up from the A100s in terms of performance, promising up to a 9x speed up in AI training like the kinds used for self-driving cars, which I'll talk about more in a minute. They also offer a whopping 30x speed up for inference models, like the massive natural language and image processing models behind GPT-3 and DALI. Grace is Nvidia's first data center CPU, and it goes on sale in early 2023. According to Nvidia, Grace can deliver 10 times the performance of today's fastest servers on the most complex AI and high performance computing workloads. One clever thing that Nvidia does is design their chips to connect together to form more powerful computers at any scale. For example, eight of these H100 chips can be connected to form a DGX H100 server system. And if you combine nine DGX H100 server systems together in a rack, you get a DGX pod, which is the reference design that can be scaled up to offer AI services at the enterprise level and beyond. But it doesn't stop there. You can link 32 of these DGX pods together to create a super pod. And Nvidia is linking 18 super pods together to build EOS, which will be the fastest AI supercomputer in the world when it comes online later this year. See what I mean about their chips being able to scale? But Nvidia doesn't just build supercomputers for themselves. Their hardware can actually be found in over 70% of the 500 most powerful supercomputers around the world. Supercomputers like Meta Platform's Research Supercluster, or RSC, which is expected to be the largest customer installation of Nvidia's hardware. This supercomputer will connect over 6,000 Nvidia GPUs to do things like translate the voices of everyone in a large group of people, each speaking a different language. And their accelerator hardware can be found in every major cloud platform like Amazon Web Services and Microsoft Azure. As the world becomes more and more data-driven, demand for Nvidia's data center hardware will keep climbing across every industry, and it's already their biggest business unit today. But it's not all sunshine and rainbows for Nvidia's data center business. Just a few weeks ago, the US government ordered AMD and Nvidia to stop selling AI chips and systems to China. And since all of the systems I just mentioned are built around Nvidia's A100 and H100 chips, they all fall under this restriction, which Nvidia said could cost them around $400 million worth of data center revenue per year. Considering their data center revenue is still growing by over 50% per year, I'm not too worried about that in the long run. And speaking of crazy growth, let's talk about Nvidia's automotive solutions next, which have grown 45% from a year ago. Nvidia showed off a lot of awesome automotive tech during GTC. Nvidia's Drive Hyperion system basically is trying to provide automakers with self-driving as a platform. Think of this as Nvidia's version of Tesla's cameras and full self-driving chip, but with a few key differences. Nvidia recently announced Hyperion 9, which supports 14 cameras, 9 radars, 3 lidars, and 20 ultrasonic sensors. With all these sensors, the Hyperion platform gives automakers many of the tools that they need for different kinds of driving scenarios. But not every automaker wants to offer full self-driving. Some just want premium features like drive assist, self-parking, and smart summon. Nvidia's Hyperion architecture is also modular, meaning automakers can use only what they need, which will really help Nvidia capture this market. Nvidia also has DriveMap, which is a crowdsourced real-time digital twin of every road that they get footage for. If Nvidia knows where a car is in real life, they know where it is inside this digital twin, 
which means they know the environment around the car, like where all the road signs are, and traffic lights, and curbs, and so on. Then the Hyperion sensors in the real car can double check what they're seeing against that digital twin. On top of that, Nvidia has a tool called Drive Sim, which takes in recorded drive data and turns everything in the scene into an interactive object. You can remove, add, or change anything in the recording to run a bunch of different simulations in that environment. Or you can change the environment altogether with different lighting effects and road hazards and trained self-driving software on different scenarios without having to collect that real data. Of course, the big thing to remember here is that these solutions compete directly with Tesla, who's been able to develop self-driving capabilities using only cameras and computer vision. If Tesla can really reach full autonomy, their sensors and systems will be significantly cheaper than radar and LiDAR-enabled systems like NVIDIA's. If you want to see a full comparison and breakdown of NVIDIA versus Tesla when it comes to self-driving, I'll link my video on it right here. Both DriveMap and DriveSim are connected to NVIDIA's Omniverse, so let's talk about that next. Omniverse has a $150 billion total addressable market by itself. The goal behind the Omniverse is to provide a toolkit to be able to make digital twins of everything in the world. The idea for the Omniverse actually came from Pixar, who needed a way to set up complicated 3D scenes so that hundreds of artists could collaborate on them in real time. That's a pretty tall order, and to solve that problem, Pixar developed the Universal Scene Description, or USD. USD is a system for representing all the elements, physics, and interactions that make up a 3D scene, kind of like how HTML and CSS are the building blocks of 2D web pages. USD makes it so that one team can work on character models, while another team works on environments, and so on. Then the Universal Scene Description itself is where you describe how everything works together. Well, Pixar open-sourced this USD standard, and it's been widely adopted by huge companies around the world. For example, Autodesk, which makes 3D modeling programs used in engineering, architecture, and entertainment, has USD integrations. So does Epic Games, the maker of Fortnite and the Unreal Engine. And Apple uses USD to represent all of their augmented and virtual reality scenes. So this is already a well-adopted standard. But... NVIDIA's Omniverse is the first application purpose-built entirely around this USD system. What Pixar's shared workflow did for large movie scenes, Omniverse does for every other industry, from architecture and engineering to art and game design. That means that one part of a factory engineering team can be working on the digital twins of different robots, while a separate team works on the conveyor belt system, and a third team architects the building, all in different industry-specific programs. Then, they plug their models into a shared scene hosted on the Omniverse. And if somebody makes an update to one of their designs, an Omniverse connector would push that update to every scene that that design is used in. What this unlocks for businesses is the ability for multiple teams to collaborate on shared 3D scenes at any size and scale. I really think that USD and NVIDIA's Omniverse will play a big role in the development of the metaverse. But even if you're skeptical of the internet moving from 2D to 3D, NVIDIA's Omniverse has a lot of other practical uses in enterprise software today. For example, connected cars can upload traffic data for logistics and delivery companies to plan and adjust their routes. Or weather services could upload weather data and models for that same kind of planning. In fact, NVIDIA made a machine learning model that emulates the movement and flow of global weather patterns to help predict extreme weather events like hurricanes and atmospheric rivers. This is a digital twin of the Earth's atmosphere called ForecastNet, and it's trained on 10 terabytes of weather system data. Combined with the Omniverse, ForecastNet can predict the path of these atmospheric rivers up to a full week in advance, and it only takes a quarter of a second to run on a single NVIDIA graphics card. That's tens of thousands of times faster than today's standard weather forecast models. Because these predictions can happen so fast, NVIDIA can generate many thousands of simulations, explore many different potential outcomes, and quantify the risks associated with these extreme weather events. While we often talk about predicting weather and climate up to a week out, NVIDIA's technologies could one day help us predict things months, years, or even decades out. And that's just one of many, many practical use cases for these AI and Omniverse-based solutions. So NVIDIA definitely has some near-term challenges in every market they operate in, especially gaming revenue from their GPUs and limits on which AI and data center chips they can sell and to who. But hopefully this quick survey of NVIDIA's latest, most advanced projects showed you that they might not be the loser that Jim Cramer is making them out to be. And we're short NVIDIA, it's a loser. 
but there's another computing company clawing their way to the top by any means necessary, and they could end up challenging NVIDIA for the AI throne. If you want to learn more about them, check out this episode next. Either way, thanks for watching, and until next time, this is Ticker Symbol U. My name is Alex, reminding you that the best investment you can make is in you.